All right. So this talk is from a rock star herself. This is on security TPM role. So without further ado, I'll, I'll just introduce Lee Snyder. Thank you. All right, awesome. Um, so my name's Lee, and as some people who walked in on time or early saw, I actually got the title of this wrong. So that's a hilarious way to get started this morning. Um, so who am I? I am a principal security engineer. And all of a sudden, everybody in the audience is going, why is the security engineer going to talk to me about the technical program manager role? Don't, don't worry, we'll get there. Um, so you can read more about me in my LinkedIn. I also did an interview for uh, TLDRSEC about my life as a Staff Plus engineer. Um, in my spare time, I run a lot of security conferences. So I used to run B-Sides Boston. I'm on B-Sides Seattle Planning Committee. Thank you. <laughs> um, I'm also over at the Diana Initiative. See? Lots of fans. Um, and I used to be a TPM, right? That's why it's okay I'm doing this talk. Um, also, my good colleague and friend, Raji, was supposed to be here with me. Unfortunately, she had a family commitment and she's not here, but she is a technical program manager today. She is a TPM manager, manager, which is really awkward to me to say. Um, so she helped me write these slides. She helped me write the abstract. So it's not just my thoughts, but my normal disclosure. These are my thoughts, not my company's. All right, why this talk? Um, I get asked all the time, how do you become a TPM? Um, how do you explore multiple domains in security? Like it seems really hard to move around in security, so how do you do it? And what are the two or three factors that were essential to your career? This role by far and away is why I am who I am today. All right, yeah, so this is B-Sides. So you knew there was gonna be audience participation at some point, I made it early. All right, so who in here is a TPM? All right, who's thinking they might someday want to be a TPM? I got some hands. All right, how about people who work with TPMs? All right, how about people who work with TPMs and actually think you know what they do? I know, that, that's a really, I know. Um, and then how many people are in this room just because you know me? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Thank you, friends. Thank you for support. All right, so this is the classic thought process of what a program manager is. And I kind of feel bad for the guy. He doesn't look happy, does he? He looks actually really unhappy. Um, I'm not a big fan of describing the role this way. I think it actually does a disservice to both the people in the role and the people they work with. Though, so, I have a funny story. I didn't actually know what this meant the first time someone said it to me. So this is my thought process. Quite literally, I went somewhere else because I have, you know, attention problems. And then I went to like, wait, I'm gonna have to hurt, about, like at what? Like, I, so hurting cats is hard. All right, um, this is gonna be hard to read, so I'm gonna read it to you guys. So this is a Twitter account called Security TPM. Uh, like an engineer who can talk to people. <laughs> so what is a technical program? Like that's like, let's start there. Um, so TPMs typically will lead large, complex, multidisciplinary, cross-functional programs. That was a lot of words. Um, so what's an example of that? So how many people remember preparing for GDPR? Yeah, I would, okay, I would hope a lot of us remember that. Um, see, a TPM, think about it, what would their role be in that type of program, right? They're going to work with legal to understand the requirements. They're probably gonna work with compliance to understand what compliance thinks. They're gonna work with developers to build the tooling that you need for GDPR. And then they're gonna work with the teams that've gotta to migrate to those tools. So you can see 
that role is working across teams. Now, today, that would probably actually be somebody who specializes in privacy. But at the time that GDPR came out, a lot of the people working in it were in security because that's what we had. Like people weren't yet specializing in privacy. What's another example? Um, often it's someone who works on something that's not a product. Well, what, what, what the heck does that mean? So a good example is a lot of people probably have done this before. You write your own detections. So TPM is going to be the person who's analyzing the data, all the different data streams coming in and saying, OK, cool. I'm going to raise my hand and figure out what we need to deliver and do that. But the important part of this, why we're talking about security, is they do it with security, right? So they have that security acumen, and they can come in and lead. I'm just going to make sure I got all my points. Whoops. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so what are some examples of programs I've led? Um, so many years ago, if you were here at B-Sides, you may have actually seen me working in a booth. I used to work for a different company. And uh, someone once asked me, what do you do? And I said, I have the most awesome job ever. I actually ran a program for developer education, but I got to work on gamification. So I got to run a capture the flag program both internally and externally. So what does that mean? Well, I had to work with the developers who built the platform. I had to work with legal, because if we were doing questions externally, we had to make sure that we weren't doing anything that would be objectionable. I had to uh, schedule the pen test, right? Because we want to make sure the platform doesn't get hacked. Um, and then I had to you know, get people to write questions. And what's interesting about this is that that wasn't anybody's job, right? I had no engineers assigned to me. I had no one, right? I'm just, I'm on my own. But a lot of people are really interested in this kind of activity. And it's a lot of fun. Um, I actually used to write the social engineering challenges for the platform. And we're going to get to why being technical matters to the TPM. Um, another example. We kind of were talking about how we saw the same class of problems over and over and over again. And working with some engineers, we went and did root cause analysis. And what we figured out is that the reason we see the same type of problems over and over again was that we really need to harden our um, platforms and frameworks, right? So what does that mean? Well, it meant I had to go convince these development teams that they wanted to work with us directly to fix the problems in their platforms or frameworks. So there's like a wide variety of work that you can do. But what would you say you do here? So I gave you some examples of technical programs. Um, I think the most important part is that you are still an expert, right? You are still a security expert. That's why they hired you. So you need to bring your security skills and your technical acumen and come in prepared to deliver. When you think about a TPM, they are the person, I'm going to try really hard not to curse, <laughs> that gets stuff done. Stuff. OK, I, get, I, did, I did it. Um, but really, they, they're the person who comes in and leads the program, right? They develop the strategy. And then they do the execution end to end. So they've got to go get buy-in from leadership. They've got to convince leadership to staff that program, right? They've got to demonstrate how it's going to be successful. So out of the gate, you've got to be thinking about what are your success metrics? What are your OKRs, right? It's not just I got to design a solution, but I got to show why that design will be successful. Oh, yeah. Some other points. Um, so remember how I mentioned they're the leader of the program. So you're going to work cross-functionally, right? You're going to work across the organization. And that's really where a TPM can add value. If you have TPMs working only within their team, and not working cross-functionally, 
and cross-organizationally, they're just not going to have the same impact. It's why that often the ratios for TPMs to engineers, there's going to be a lot more engineers than TPMs. Um, but some of this kind of depends on the company. I'll be really honest. My background is entirely FANG. So that's going to cloud my experience, right? Like, but really, um, you're going to find some places will just have a handful of TPMs. Some people have fleets of TPMs, right? So it really does vary. But the important part is you're the leader of that program. You're the person who owns it and drives it end to end. And you, you bring in that security expertise and that, that experience that you've had. The funny thing is, um, I didn't start as a security TPM, right? So my background originally is pretty normal IT trajectory, right? I started in the help desk. I help people fix their computers. It was not my favorite thing to do. Um, I became a desktop engineer, so then I could ship, you know, OSs to people, basically. Um, I moved to a standard systems engineer role, you know, so then I would build systems. And then eventually I landed in identity and access management, which I actually really like. To this day, I still really like IM. I think it's a great role. Um, and that's how I became a TPM, actually. Like, I was an identity and access management engineer. I became an IAM TPM. And then I thought, well, security's kind of cool. I could do that. And uh, hilariously got hired in AppSec. You all just listen to my background. Is there anything I just said that said I could code? In case you're wondering, I, I still can't really code. I'm, I'm actually a decent scripter, but please, please don't make me code. But that's the beauty of this role. All right, so what's the difference between a TPM and a PMT? So a PMT is a product manager technical. And this is hilariously not lined up. Um, so the biggest difference is a TPM, remember I told you they focus on programs, often programs that aren't products. But a PMT is all about the product, and they're all about the product lifecycle. They care so much about the customer needs, the customer voice. They are the what and the why. That is what they focus on entirely, the what and the why. TPM does not care about the what and the why. We care about the how, the when, and the who, which is why we do things like develop workback schedules. We figure out who we need across the company, and we figure out how we're gonna get it done. Often we have to figure out how are we gonna get it done with the least amount of resources and as fast as possible. And that's when that strategy and execution becomes so critical, right? So we focus on milestones, deliverables, resource allocation, and measurement. Like that is the bread and butter of the job. Okay, so what's the difference between a TPM and an EM? EM here being engineering manager. They look similar, right? You got the how, the when, and the who. Yeah, I did that right, okay. Um, but the biggest difference is the engineering manager is focused, now this assumes they're also just like a standard, like, I don't know what the right definition is, but they just have a team. They're not a senior manager, they're not a director, so just, just go with me on this analogy for a bit. Um, they focus on their team, right? Like that is their focus, right? They do team deliverables, they do team allocation. They also do performance management. Um, the TPM though is like, I'm gonna focus, again, it's the same thing as it was on the other slide, right? And, but it's across the org. Like that's the biggest difference, I think, is that really you're focused across the org, across the company, not just within a team. Now this changes obviously as you go up the engineering ladder as an engineering manager, you start obviously looking across, so I don't want people to get the wrong impression. One of the interesting things is a lot of times people forget that the TPM can help you, let's say you don't have enough resources to get something done. The TPM is the one that's, that's gonna go and advocate. It doesn't necessarily have to be the engineering manager advocating for additional resources. Or let's say the project has gone totally off the rails. 
the TPM is the one that's going to go explain to leadership why it's off the rails and what they are going to do to fix it. Again, helping the engineering manager. Um, so those are the differences. The interesting thing is that often people start out as TPMs and they'll learn a lot about strategy and execution. And let's be clear, you learn a lot about people management and they'll go on to become engineering managers. It is a very, very common path. I've done it. Okay, so we talked a lot about like what they do. What's not in scope for a TPM? I mean, there's a reason I say just, right? If you find yourself just taking notes, just scheduling meetings, just reporting, guess what you're not? You are not a TPM. I don't know what that job is, but it's not a TPM. Um, I mean, I kind of, I love this. I started the day with problems and now I lost the spreadsheets. Again, not a TPM, but pretty funny. So what if you find yourself in this situation? Like, how do you get out of it? I've had to coach a lot of people who found themselves in these roles, unexpectedly, wildly technical people, right? Wildly talented, great at execution, but for whatever reason, the org was just like, I just need a note taker, so here you go. There are so many ways. So let's say all you're doing is taking notes. Well, out of notes come action items, right? You're in a meeting, you're taking the notes, you're discussing what should happen. Start suggesting the action items. Start demonstrating that ownership. Um, let's say, again, you find yourself only doing reporting. For whatever reason, that's all you do. You just send status reports. Like, start owning some of that, right? Do the data analysis, show that you can do the data analysis, write the dashboards. There's lots of ways to also demonstrate your technical skills. You could script something, right? Automate a simple thing, but make everybody's lives better. Go chat with the engineers. Hey, what's your big engineering problem? And try to show how you can help solve it, right? Look for, pro like literally, seek out problems and fix them. That's how you demonstrate your value. Now this one's probably a little strange to people. They're like, why is mentoring engineers on this list? So think about what a TPM is good at. They're good at problem solving. They're good at execution. They're good at leadership. They're good at program management, right? They're good at getting people together, moving in the same direction to get things done. Guess what you have to do as you climb the engineering ladder as an IC? Everything I just listed. If you cannot do that, you can probably get promoted still. Like you can probably get promoted purely on your technical skills and congratulations. You wanna be a phenomenal leader? That's not gonna get you far enough. Okay, so what makes the TPN successful? We talked about a lot of this already, right? But a big one is you really do need to understand systems architecture and design. Um, so think about it, like if you're having a conversation with your engineering counterpart and you don't understand what they're telling you, go get a book. Like go learn that system. You are paid to understand how systems work together, how to anticipate the bottlenecks in them, you're paid to find the problems that people create in their own designs. Um, what's really interesting about this to me is that background, as we talked about, came up as an engineer. This is the easiest part of the interview. This is like the most delightful part of the interview for me. They were like, just design a system for me. I was like, great, can I do this all day? Like when we got to the, tell me how you're gonna measure success. I was like, I've never done that before, but here are my thoughts. Um, if you cannot do this, I have a slide later that will give you some great uh, primers for how to learn how to do it. You really need to have security knowledge or interest. And why do I say or interest? 
So remember earlier, I said I came out of IAM, right? That's an adjacent field. I think it's a fair call, right? And I remember my interview being asked like, everything about authentication and authorization, we like geeked out on certificates, which still cracks me up to this day. But you had all, I had all these transferable skills. So yeah, I, as I said, I wasn't a developer. I didn't know how to code, but I did understand systems design. So they threw a system and they're like, what's wrong with this? And that was an interesting experience because I wasn't yet as experienced in security as I am now, but I could, I could find the flaws in the authentication and the authorization. And so past that interview, whew. Um, okay, that's neat. All right, I won't walk that way. Um, okay, what else? So you're there to drive clarity, right? When there's ever confusion or people are on the same page, you are there to ensure that we all like march to the beat of the same drummer, right? So that you're really driving that clarity. You're either removing blockers or you're trying to anticipate blockers. So a lot of ways people talk about that is you're looking around corners, right? So you're anticipating when something might go wrong and calling it out. And this is actually um, really interesting to me because more junior folks will often try to hide these problems when they're TPMs. So the, a classic way to talk about a program and how it's going is it's either a stoplight, right? It's either red, yellow, green. Green means everything's great, program is super healthy, we're going to meet all our deliverables, it's awesome. Yellow means we're at risk, there's some problems, we need to develop a path to green. Red means we are blocked and we actually need help figuring out a path forward. Too often, a junior TPM will tell you it's green right up until delivery and then suddenly it's red. And the problem with that is they're afraid to ask for help. They're afraid to show any sort of vulnerability. And I can't stress this enough. Go get help. Go ask engineers for help. Go ask other TPMs for help. Go ask a manager for help. Go ask for help. Never, never hide just how off the rail something is going. Um, you need to be able to communicate with all kinds of people. So remember how earlier we were talking about the program might involve legal and it might involve developers and it might involve product. It's gonna definitely involve leadership. Every single one of those audiences is different. And getting in front of all of them and being able to communicate properly to all of them is a learned skill. I was not good at it at first. Um, came from an engineering background. I talked like an engineer. I really did have to learn this, but this is a huge skill set. So think about it. You want to climb again as an engineer? You're going to be in front of a VP or a director. You get to do this way earlier as a TPM. You know, I was a very junior TPM when I was talking to VPs. Um, I was talking to SVPs. And I remember thinking, I don't know why I'm in this room. I am not high enough, I'm not important enough, but that is the brilliance of this role. You're gonna influence up, down, across. Often people say this is without authority. And I think the reason they say that is, remember, you're not responsible for the engineers that are on your team. You're not responsible for the engineers you're working across the org. You're not writing their performance reviews. You might influence them, but you're not actually leading that team. Here's the problem with that. You're the program owner. You are the authoritative source for the program. You have authority, use it. So getting hired or hiring, and I will have to check my notes because Raji wrote a lot of this slide. I did not. Um, so you do need technical program or project management experience. And so often people ask me, well, you know, like I'm an engineer, how do I do that? Run a project, raise your hand, say, hey, I saw that we're gonna do this smaller thing just in our team. It's not gonna involve a lot of other people. Figure out how that works. Show what the milestones are, like figure out the success metrics. I mean, that's, that is literally what I did as an engineer, just because I thought it'd be interesting, right? 
I, I like weird things, I'll admit that. Um, but then what I was able to do, because I had done that, right, is, is tailor my resume to demonstrate, hey, I have some PM skills, I could probably do the rest. Um, so, and let's say you can't even do that work for some reason. Remember how earlier we were talking about community experience? Raise your hand and volunteer for an event like this. Try to get on the organizing committee. That will demonstrate your PM skills, right? Like run something end to end. Talk about how, how do you measure the success of a conference? By the way, that's really hard. <laughs> but now you have something you can go into an interview and talk about. Um, we talked about systems design. I, okay, so the first one is the thing I send to people because I think it's a great resource and it's free. The second one is the one that Raji recommended. I've never read it, but I trust her a lot. So she says it's good, it's good. But I also feel like I have to warn you, I've never read it. You need to have communication skills and collaboration skills. So any way you can demonstrate thinking about different audiences and how you collaborate with people across the aisle, really helpful. So are you the kind of person who runs towards problems or do you run away? If you run towards problems, great role for you. If you run away, this is probably not the role for you. I'll be really honest. You've got to have a lot of tenacity to be successful. Um, you need analytical thinking. You've got to think through problems. You're going to be throwing stuff at the interview you've never thought about, and you're just going to have to work through it on the spot. Like seriously, when I first interviewed for a TPM role, I, still, I will never forget this. I had explained the project I was running. It was an Active Directory upgrade, pretty standard kind of thing at the time, right? And the, the TPM interviewed me is like, okay, well, how do you know if it was successful? And like, frankly, my first response was, well, we upgraded and we didn't have an outage. He's like, it's not really a success metric though, is it? And I was like, oh no, you're, you're totally right. To this day, I have no idea what I said. It was like, this was the most stressful interview I'd ever had. But I kind of walked through like, well, you know, thinking about it, I would ask stakeholders, did we do appropriate communications? You know, obviously it is a success is, it was it successful or not? Did we do it on the budget? Did we do it on the timeline? And so I kind of walked through and the guy just kept I mean, he just kept going at it. Like, well, what about this and what about that? And like, I do think just if you can think quickly on your feet, you'll be okay. But if you're not used to talking about what makes something successful, I do think that would be some time to spend. You wanna demonstrate leadership skills. Again, you're gonna to have to corral a bunch of people. We talked about that a little earlier without authority. Again, you have authority, please own it. Um, and you really should have security interest or exposure. So Raji obviously hires a lot of TPMs. And I was asking her for some stories about like, what are the, what do you, what's memorable about candidates? And she pointed out something that I thought was really interesting. So TPMs really have to listen. They really have to engage in active listening. And to be frank, everyone should engage in active listening, but they don't always, right? And she's explaining that she's this great candidate, super excited by them, and they, they weren't listening to what she's asking in the interview. And in fact, they got kind of belligerent and angry at because she just kind of kept asking them questions, you know, trying to really understand their answers. And she was like, all right, that's that's neat. That's that's not the right person, right? And so her point was, you know, if you are in an interview situation, you know, engage in the act of listening. Demonstrate, like even if you're confused, I think you can respond in a way that's super helpful, right? Like, oh, I'm not sure I understood that question. Could you reframe it? Could you rephrase it? Like people ask me that all the time and I'm fine with that, right? But what you don't want to do is tell the person basically, I think your questions are dumb. Like, don't do that. So, here are things you don't need. You don't need to understand specific technology at the company. Now, obviously, if you understand 
I'm trying to think of the, all the like actual programs out there. Let's say you don't understand Jira. You've never used Jira. But if you've used a tool that's like Jira, like you're gonna be okay, right? Because you can talk through, you know, how do I think about milestones? How do I think about deliverables? But you don't need to know the exact program the company's using. And people actually get really tripped up on this. They'll write me and say, but I don't know Jira. And I'm like, oh my God, but have you used ADO? Like, have you used anything? What have you used? Have you used spreadsheets? And they're like, yes. And I'm like, great. We'll walk through why that skill set will actually work for Jira. So don't, don't get too upset if you don't know the specific framework or technology. Um, you can learn a new security domain. So here's the really interesting thing, I think, right? Came from an engineering background. I worked really hard to develop those skill sets. And I was really good as an IAM engineer. I mean, I was really good. I would find problems. I would call Microsoft and be like, I don't know what to do. Here's like the 20 things I've done already. And they'd be like, please hold. And I was like, oh no, I've broken support. Um, and eventually they would you know, find somebody at the company who was a principal and they would work with me and I'd be like, great, and I fixed the thing, right? And it, so I was really good at it. I can't go be a different engineer, not easily. Like it was much harder when I thought about like when I wanted to grow, I was like, you're really cool to go do something else. But my background was I am and I knew it inside and out. As I said, it worked really great for my AppSec TPM interview, but I'm not convinced that it would have been as easy to move into a different engineering field as it has been for me to move around as a TPM, right? So as a TPM, you know, as I said, I did IM, and then I did AppSec, and then I did portfolio management. That was weird. Um, I did privacy, right? Like I had a lot more opportunities to move around because I had all these other skill sets. I could learn the next domain. So some examples of what other people have done. I had a friend who did security awareness, right? So that's very much rooted in like teaching people about basics and security. And she was really interested in the incident response. And when a job opened up, she moved into incident response, right? Like not as an engineer, to be clear, again, as a TPM, but think about it. If you're doing education, how easy would it be then to move to incident response. I'm not saying you can't do it. I'm just saying this is an easier path. I had another friend who did uh, developer edu I had a lot of friends who do education. I'm realizing all my examples are, are based on that. They did developer education, right? And so that's all very much about teaching developers, you know, the basics, like OWASP top 10, making sure they understand like security policies, right? And that they can do all that. And then they moved to security assessments for M&A. They're similar, but very different skill sets. But again, as a TPM, you have the ability to move around a lot. I'm, I'm really not kidding. It is just about anything. Um, I was an engineer. That is a very common path. I'll be really honest. You get engineers that are just like, I'm so sick of building. Can I do something else? And they become a TPM. That's what, I mean, literally, that was the conversation I had with the hiring manager. I said, I don't want to build anymore. If I never have to be in a data center again, I'm good. It's cold, it's loud, it's annoying. If I never have to deal, you know, with the private cloud, because that's what it was at the time. There wasn't, I mean, there was a public cloud, but most of us were, you know, using VMware. If I never have to think about moving my, off physical servers to VMs, I'm good. I really want to do strategy. Like I was like, I got a role for you. Um, a lot of people were engineering managers. But remember how I said earlier, a TPM becomes an engineering manager? And then sometimes people get sick of performance management. Um, I talk about this all the time when people ask me, why aren't you a manager anymore? I truly hate performance management. Thank God there are people who love it because I hate it. I hate it so much. It stresses me out. I just, I, I'm not, I will mentor all day long, but I don't want to be responsible for the growth of other humans. I really don't. And I think some people just get burned out as engineering managers and they, 
you know, come back and be a TPM. Um, you got project managers, program managers, product managers. So sometimes folks will start in a non-technical role, right? They've got that great like writing background. They've got a great education background. They can, they can really do great communication skills, but they need to grow their technical experience. And there are people who've done this. And I think that's awesome. Um, quality assurance. That one probably feels like a left field one, but I know people who are like, got sick of writing a bunch of QA jobs and decided that they wanted to go organize humans instead. But often what you find is they're just not candidates that fit neatly into another box. This is like the everything role. The other thing I forgot to mention is it's actually a lot easier to move to TP, TPM in your own company. So if it's something you really are passionate about, I would recommend just trying to convince somebody at your own company. I tried that. They told me no. So then I went and interviewed at another company who said, sure. So don't let it, don't let someone who says no deter you. Just find somebody else. Okay, so why I love this job. And then I, I'm, I'm waiting, I know somebody's gonna ask why I don't do this anymore. Um, there was never a dull moment. There really wasn't. There were times that I wanted to scream. There are times I wanted to literally throw the computer out the window and send like a carrier pigeon saying I quit. Um, it's a trying job at times, but it was never dull. Um, you have so many opportunities to grow. Like, please, 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 if you are interested, go read my TLDRC interview. I talk a lot about how this role was so critical to my own personal growth. I went from being, as I said, really good engineer to being able to understand how to communicate with leadership. And it just, it opened the door to so many opportunities. Um, my path was weird. Well, everybody's path is weird. But what I did is that I am engineer and then I am TPM and an apps like TPM and then I became a security engineering manager. And then I was like, oh, I kind of miss TPM. So I went back, did a principal TPM. And then I was like, oh, I don't really like this. And then I went back and did privacy engineering. And then I really hated that. That's a different story for a different day. Um, and then I was like, well, now what do I do? And so I interviewed for a bunch of roles and I had like an offer to be a CISO and I was like, oh, I am not ready for that. Um, I had an offer to be a director and I was like, eh, I don't think that's a good thing. And so I ended up being a principal security engineer again. And that's what I think is cool. Like there is no one way door, right? And I used to joke, but uh, TPM is the only job you are paid to network. Well, I'm not kidding. Like you have to be okay with picking up the phone and calling a random engineering manager, a random director, a random VP, a random engineer, another TPM. And you have to build your network and get people to trust you. And that's what makes this really cool because you're constantly networking. And because you're constantly networking, a whole host of opportunities will just open up for you. And that is what I have, my friends. Another joke for you. Does anyone have any questions? How would you compare it to the uh, that's a great question. So the question is, oh, okay, you go. Everyone else is just asking, comparing the TPM role to the principal security engineer role. So I, I will get in trouble for saying this. And I will have other engineers tell me I'm wrong. I think a principal security engineer has to be a really phenomenal engineer and a really phenomenal TPM. Often you're gonna be the person that's advocating for the new thing. And you're gonna demonstrate how we can do the new thing. You're gonna run the POC yourself. You're gonna demonstrate what, what does success look like, right? And so you have to do both as a principal security engineer. And I think 
all the leadership skills you get from being a TPM make it possible for you to be a wildly successful principal engineer. That's just my opinion. <laughs> Anyone else? Oh, come on, you don't have any, oh, yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, are there any obstacles or challenges regarding being a TPM that's unique to being a TPM that you don't see in other engineering roles or any kind of security role? Yes. <laughs> um, so the reason I have the like just doing X is because often people will discount your, your capabilities. Like they will just assume you are there to, like, I'll give you an example. This engineer pings me on, you know, whatever chat platform we have. I really need a meeting with so-and-so. I'm thinking to myself, what, you don't have Outlook? But whatever, I'm really good at calendaring. No problem, I'll schedule the meeting for you. Don't do that. Gets worse, we go into the meeting. I get a high, priority escalation from leadership. And at this point, I'm no longer paying attention to the meeting, right? Like I'm trying to address what leadership needs because that's way more important than whatever the heck's going on in this room. We get done and he's like, can I have your meeting notes? And that was when I blew a top. I explained what my role was. And that, that actually I think is a real big challenge. You will constantly have to remind people why you're there and what value you add, which is weird, because as an engineer, I never had to explain the value I added. But as a TPM, I always did. And I politely pointed out that he asked for the meeting, he owned the meeting. It's his, like, why don't you take notes, man? Like, it's your meeting. Um, so I think that's the biggest challenge of being a TPM. And it was not one I was prepared for. Thank you. Any more questions? Well, you can find me on LinkedIn. You think of anything else. I really hope that I encourage at least one person to consider this role. We desperately need more security TPMs. I think it's an awesome role. So please reach out. I'm happy to help you figure out that path. Thank you, Lee.